All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Fred Dixon. I will get each of the panelists here in the uh, AI in the Future of Education Roundtable. This is Big Blue Button World 2023. Uh, the purpose of this roundtable is to help guide folks in terms of understanding what's going on uh, in the industry with uh, all the things they see in AI and maybe think a little bit more critically about it and give you uh, a good spirit of discussion. We may not always agree on everything. In fact, I hope we don't. Allison, over to yourself, please introduce. Hi everyone, I'm Allison Powell. I'm the Chief Academic Officer of Evergreen Education Group, which runs the Digital Learning Collaborative and hosts the DLAC Digital Learning Annual Conference. And I've been in the field of online hybrid learning for the past 25 years, started as a teacher and started some virtual and hybrid schools in Las Vegas, Nevada, and then have been in the association world supporting the field and schools around the world for the last 20 plus years. So excited to be here. Thank you, Allison. John. Hi, I'm John Fila. I primarily teach English to high schoolers in an online asynchronous setting. Um, I've been teaching online for uh, about 15 years now. I've been a teacher for 24 and I have been doing a lot of uh, training around the country on topics like OER accessibility and now AI has become uh, the major focus of the work I do outside uh, of my district and um, just really interested in continuing the conversation about it. Thank you, John. And Stephen. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Laddick. Many people know me as Laddick. Uh, I work for a company called OpenLMS. I'm the principal of e-learning advocacy, advocacy. And uh, my job is Kind of threefold. I, um, I I manage our blog at the eLearn Magazine. I host uh, both in person and virtual summits for us, and I run the eLearn podcast as well. I invite everybody to come check out that podcast. But most recently, I think what you were interested in, Fred, was the fact I, I hosted a summit called the AI and Learning Summit. Uh, I've had the privilege of interviewing something more like something like around five hundred people over the last four or five years. Um, around how do we do online education better and so ai and learning as a topic is you know sort of a, a very logical evolution in the, in those conversations so i'm happy to bring those insights to this conversation thank you stephen and look i want to also thank the audience that has joined us i can see everybody here in the list as we talk please um put questions in the chat agree or disagree with what we say we want to make it interactive uh and i think a lot of you are here because you probably again want to gain a better insight in terms of how AI could be AI could be used to improve education. Uh, maybe not some of the things that we see today. <clears throat> John, you are the educator. You are the teacher. Uh, you are the ultimate recipient. You and your students of whatever we bequeath as technologists, um, ideas, developers. Why don't you start and give us a sense of what you've seen in the last six months? Uh, on the influx of AI tools in your teaching and learning and what you uh, believe will happen in the next six months. I've sort of cast your crystal ball ahead and it can be a positive thing or negative thing. And I think that'll probably give us points of departure for the discussion. Yeah, so I, I, you know, last December, I started noticing something really odd about my student submissions. I teach about 200 students uh, across the state of Minnesota and you know, just trying to get a handle on what it was that was changing and people who um, anywhere from never never heard of something like ChatGPT to all the way to students who wanted to try to use it for everything. Um, you know, I think initially I made some mistakes uh, about being a little bit more accusatory in my language with, with my learners. And especially in the beginning of the class, it was a struggle to um, figure out what the right response to those submissions were in a way that didn't um, harm the relationship that I was trying to build with them. So, you know, really started just trying to focus on uh, what it was, what's what was the appropriate use of these tools, um, and then just experimenting with them myself. Um, you know, I think what has been the biggest challenge is just trying to wrap the heads are on this just as a staff, you know, so some people are more comfortable using these tools, giving learners feedback about the use. And I think in the next six months, the biggest struggle 
um, aside from just having a consistent response across organizations is going to be you know one thing i haven't really heard anybody talk about it in all of this new development is what do we tell the public because there's a large segment of the public that uh, thinks ai has a liberal bias and doesn't want people to use it at all you know we've seen some pretty contentious school board meetings across the united states and you know i think this is going to be the next phase of that where um, as people start to find out these tools are being used to create lessons uh, support assessments uh, build courses and then students will be using it teachers may use it to help support feedback uh, i think we're going to see a lot of blowback from people who don't understand what the tools are how they were trained um, you know there's just there, there's still a lot we don't know and while I'm really excited about utilizing these tools in, in my own work uh, and helping students navigate this world, uh, I think that's going to be a big challenge for me. The other thing is um, we just don't we just don't have a great um, way to distinguish the extent to which students want to use it. Um, you know, some, I teach primarily seniors who are ready to graduate. They want, they just want to be done. And if, you know, students are great at seeing hypocrisy. If they see teachers using it to lighten their workload, they're gonna wonder why they can't do it as well. So it, it's, it's not as much the tool itself, it's how we're going to talk about it, how we're going to all get on the same page about it. Good points. And maybe Allison, I see you nodding your head a bit. Like, why don't you, what are your thoughts on what John had just sort of described as the, the current, almost sounds like educating the educators and educating students uh, before just giving the tool to them? Yeah, your I thoughts? Think, yeah, I totally agree. I think that's been one of the biggest issues in education as we get the nice, next bright, shiny object and just say, here you go. Good luck. And we buy all these tools and stuff, but we don't take the time to actually figure out how do we use this to make education better and help engage and help students learn. And so it's it's this bright new shiny object, but I think this is gonna be the next big thing. Like we talk about transforming education, but this could be the actual next thing that transforms education since probably the computer or the internet. Um, We've gotten lots of new technologies, but nothing's been this big, I think, that's really gonna, it's probably one of the biggest transformations we'll see in our lifetimes, um, all of us on this call. So how do we take that and use it for good? Because there's gonna be good and bad and all technologies that we use once they're um, introduced to us. So it's gonna change. We're gonna have to be open because this is dynamic. Um, it's we're, we're at the beginning stages of it. So like you said, in six months, who, this could be a totally different conversation. So how do we use that? How do we train teachers um, and let the kids experiment too and help train and learn together? I think it's gonna be um, one of the most important things as we learn more and more about AI and as it advances. Um, and there's just so many tools coming out. So how do we pick the right ones to use? Um, but that's the thing, it's a, tool. it's a tool. We still need the humans in the classroom to create those relationships and the teachers are still gonna be there to support the learning, but how do we use this tool for teaching and learning now? And I'm gonna turn to Stephen, like the question that Alice is, how do we use a tool? It's another way of saying, how do we judge the success of using AI, like how should we think about uh, evaluating whether it's used successfully or not? And there's a policy part to that and there's the actual use of it and the introduction of it. Curious your thoughts, Stephen. The thing that I find most interesting, both in this conversation and the ones I've had uh, over the last, let's say eight months now <clears throat> on this topic specifically is the deer in headlights kind of you know beginning of the conversation it's like oh my gosh what are we going to do about this ai that is now you know which which at the end of the day we, we very happily forget that we've been using ai for you know decades now and you know if, if you were you or i were to you know go on a road trip 
And the friend that we were going to go on that road trip with came and, you know, they're they all excited. They got their pack, they put it in the back and then they opened up a paper map like you have here on the screen right now is our thing. We'd all kind of scratch our heads because most of us would pull up maps or Google maps or some other, you know, AI driven technology that would not only, you know, build our direction, but tell us when there's traffic happening and, you know, what other routes to do and those kinds of things. So we've been, you know, and this is in cars, this is in everything. And in education, it's been there for a long time. I mean, the, one of the biggest examples that we have is Duolingo. <clears throat> They've been using AI forever, and it's the most popular education app out there, right? What I have seen, you know, and and, and I'm I'm going to try to talk about this. I'm not trying to promote my own you know deal here, but as I as we went through the summit, you know, just a couple months ago, that as we talked, we we looked at what are the tools of today, and that was one of the tracks. Um, we we then another track was what was the near and not so near future of you know, what's coming down the pipe in, in terms of technology and thought processes. And then what are the challenges? And ultimately what I've taken away from that first uh, session that we had in June around this was the tools have already, there are not only have they been there, but th th this is an inevitability. So it's not a matter of choosing whether or not we're going to participate. We, we are participating. It is, it is happening. It's an inevitability, right? The, what's coming in the near future, the not so near, it are, there's some incredible things. I'm, I'm thinking right now of a gentleman named Bodo Hohen, who is, he's the co-founder of a, of a company called Knowledge. And he talks about, you know, going from zero to becoming a complete expert in, you know, biohacking infrastructure for his daughter who got a rare disease. And then they had to figure out how do we, you know, work with this, this disease. And he used all of these AI tools in order to do that. So what does the future of learning look like? It's absolutely incredible and fascinating. The thing that we really are going to be confronted with is what I think, John, you just, you nailed it on the head in that we um, really are going to need to think about what is it, what, what are all the human pieces to this? The easiest one, or, or is there the most comfort, not confrontational, the the one that puts it on the table for anyone in K through 12 or even in higher ed right now is critical thinking skills. How do we prove or how do we show that our learners are actually acquiring knowledge? And then, you know, how are we, how are we making sure that they're actually in, in engaging with material? But the second one is how do we assess that? How do we actually assess that they've acquired that knowledge, right? But then I go to the, to the, even to the next level as well, where if I'm an educator, if I'm an instructional designer, if I'm a professor, if I'm somebody who's building education, let's just take this one example. If we have all of these tools that create massive efficiencies, what am I going to do with that 50, 60, 70% of my time that I just got back? And how do we do this? Um, so, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I've talked too much already for my opening salvo here, but I think it's those human pieces, right? It's those human pieces that are the most interesting thing because and, and and if you want to be controversial, I'm very excited to talk about the hard the hard questions around that. So, okay, I want to take a moment and actually poll the audience to get a sense of who our audience is in this session. So I just put up a poll. Everybody can. I don't think you guys are going to see it because you're in moderators, but I'm basically no, asking. Oh, you see it? Okay. So let's get a little sample of who is listening in, and I'll give a moment for it to respond back. Uh, can see lots of educators, lots of heads of online learning, some developers as well. The um, the human side of it is incredibly important, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll queue up the next sort of thoughts. Uh, we just went through fourteen years of an experiment where we gave everybody who had access to computers and phone uh, social media accounts, where they gave them all access, and it really was a let's do this and see what happens afterwards. And it feels like we're in a similar case right now with AI, where as much as OpenAI and ChatGPT and others say, we disclosed this so that we want to get responsible feedback on it, they disclosed it. And I think it was, Stephen, you mentioned that the ChatGPT actually went down a little bit recently because the school term has ended. People I'll, I'll find that article, I'll put it in the chat, but it was in Forbes where, yeah, in June, the, for the first time ever, ChatGPT's usage actually dropped. And the ultimate analysis is it's like, hey, because every all the kids went on school on summer vacation. So, you know, that that that's an incredible, you know, right there. I'll put it in the chat right now. All right. So just in terms of like what we see so far, um, most of more people here are the educators. Um, I can see there's some heads of online learning, uh, some developers and that. Um, th this 
experiment that we're doing right now is it feels like a, both a capitalistic and an entrepreneur experiment where we're making uh, chat tools available for everybody. Uh, Stephen, you pointed out ChatGPT actually existed as GPT. It wasn't until a chat interface became in front of it. And what I think that tells us is that once you create a way for a human to interact with something like another human, there's this, all this door opens up. I didn't have to program anything. I didn't have to figure out a user interface. I could just start asking questions and getting responses back. And John, I wanna, I wanna bring it back to yourself. Like you saw this firsthand, uh, what students were doing and you're living with the challenges of like trying to suss out is this plagiarism or not, which I will say, I think is just a, it's a never ending battle. I don't know that that's the, the, the focus of the industry shouldn't be on detecting plagiarism. It should be some results. If you could wave a magic wand, what do you think the focus should be on responsible uses of AI and education in the next six to 12 months? What would you yeah, like well, to see? Well, I'll tie it back a little bit to your example of giving people social media accounts because it started off as this wonderful thing and ways to connect and then quickly fragmented us. And now we have people living in these feedback loops where they're only seeing the kinds of information that they want to see, right? So um, that's creating quite a divide. And what I worry is going to happen with this tool is that, um, <clears throat> for instance, where I work, um, I can try to account for the implicit bias of the tool, of the programmers, by integrating um, items into my prompt that incorporate social emotional learning, anti-racist responses, um, you know, making sure that things are um, created with universal design for learning in mind. So making things accessible. So I, I have the ability to ask for and prompt these things that aren't going to happen by default. And we have a lot of people now that are just using it to kind of recreate some of the broken practices that we've always had, but just better and faster. So what I, you know, what I'd like to see um, is having that discussion about Im implicit bias. Of what what does a, an appropriate prompt look like? I think the kinds of ways that I'm using it are illegal in other states right now, and, and so because of that. Um, we we aren't going to have kind of a, a, um, a collective response to all of this because of all the local control of these school districts around the country, um, the differences between states in the U.S. It just doesn't um, it just doesn't feel like we're we're going to have a, a singular approach. It's going to be very organization specific. Um, I wish that wasn't the case. It also makes me think that's why it probably won't transform education the way it has the potential to. Um, but um, some some guidelines, uh, uh, you know, maybe even legislative guidelines around how to use it um, might be appropriate. Mm, I think what you're trying to say is like, we can't just let it do everything. Uh, some constraints here will be very helpful so that people focus their thoughts in terms of using AI for education in certain ways and not in other ways, and just kind of simplify the life for a little bit. Again, it feels like the social experiment that we're just all going through. If I, sure. if I may, one of the problems that John is talking about, I think, if we dialed back social media you know, to the beginning and started thinking about, you know, if there would have been or is, would have been some way to verify or, yeah, I guess verify is the right word, any message that was sent by any one person, right? It would have been very interesting because ultimately we would have moved from the internet of an anonymity to the internet of, okay, I'm posting this and this is me and this is what I'm doing. We have the same problem in AI in the black box problem that we don't know where answers are coming from, right? In that, you know, you put something into ChatGPT or BART or one of the other tools that are out there and you're not quite sure you they even we can't even a, a person who created it can't quite tell you how did that you know how did that answer get generated and we're you know we're starting to now see attempts at finding citations and those kinds of things like at least they can say hey this these are the places where i drew the information from that's what the ai is telling you but it can't quite get that right and so um, that particular piece right there is, you know, where did it come from? It all cascades down to John, again, you put this on the table, I think correctly in the beginning is that, you know, all of these tools are built on piles of data, right? They're, they're built on data sets. And so those data sets can be organizational specific, personally specific, 
statewide specific again you know in the in the summit uh, one of the presentations we had was from guanajuato mexico where a, a group of people went down and uh, actually were able to look at data that was generated by ai tools in the state education system and they used a tool called the ibm uh, three I, ibm 360 fairness tool to determine there's actually a you know a significant gender bias in that tool around reporting for uh, at rest students and you know uh, education outcomes and whatnot. So it's very very interesting stuff. But it really all comes back to that these tools are built on these piles of data, and data is super super messy. Mm. Okay, so Allison, I see you nodding your head. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm like I agree with all of this, and it's it's just advancing so fast, and so it is being built on this. Um, these different data sets, but creating those policies is hard too, as it's coming around so fast. And it's, I mean, people are making fake videos and stuff that are really hard to tell, but then there's software coming out to say like, okay, this has been edited or fake, but like then the next thing comes out. And so it takes a while, it's back and forth and back and forth. And so it's really hard especially here in the US, it's district by district for policies or state by state. Um, but then you have the whole world. This isn't just a US issue. Like Stephen said, it's in Mexico. We've been working with several countries all over the world and some places they're banning it and the others are open to it and like it's a free for all. So it's trying to find like what's that sweet spot in the middle, but keeping the policies open and dynamic enough to keep up with the technology because there's always going to be those bad guys out there that are going to try to find the worst way to use it versus the positive ways to use it and so how do we keep that balance because it's horrible to say the bad things are going to come out but we've got to we're going to learn from that and protect it and create new policies around that so um i think it is important um, as John said too, I'm all over the place right now. I'm just fascinated by all of this, but the bias and topic. stuff. <laughs> it is. It's a big topic. <laughs> um, maybe what I can say is this: like, I, I think the policy um, argument is very relevant right now, especially the diversity approaches. If I imagine back when calculators first came out in schools, I'm imagining schools were not uniform in their policy towards pop calculators and that uh, some did and some didn't. And eventually it all got to a place where, okay, it's a tool if it's used in this way, you know, you can have your calculator doing the exam or you can't. Uh, and that changed a lot when calculators started to record things. Uh, I, I believe there's gonna be a tipping point. So John, this is sort of coming off of yours. I'm imagining a school where it has some number of students and the parents have a huge role and the, uh, some students in the school have access to some AI that's not from the school, but let's say they pay for something. Someone's come up with a really good idea of using AI. And those students are starting to do better in the school. A parent comes in and uh, the teacher say, you know, and finds out that half the kids in the school, half the, half the kids in their son or daughter's class are doing better than their son or daughter and asks why. And the teacher says, well, they're, it looks like they're using something like X. I think that parent is probably going to go back and say, how do I get X? How do I give my son or daughter the advantage? And that X would be something driven by AI. Uh, I'll put this as an open question. What is X? What is that thing that's going to tip where a school may be a little struggling with AI, but once they see the benefits of this, by the students, the learning outcomes, they're gonna come around like they did with calculators and say, okay, I don't think we should ban this anymore. This seems to be a good use of it, but what is that use? And I'll open this up to anybody if they wanna take a shot at it. Well, I might just push back on a minute for the comparison to calculators because I, I hear that a lot. And with a calculator, we know we and can verify the process uh, mm -hmm. by which that response comes out. If I'm having AI write an essay or a lesson, it's making assertions and supporting those assertions, and I have no idea how that's actually happening, right? So if I, um, you know, I think having 
students actually take the AI response by default, so they're not compelled to or feel like they can cheat. But but using that response and then saying, okay, now this this is the response. These are the claims. Um, go out and find credible information that can support and validate or invalidate those claims. And then now we've kind of transformed what was writing an essay kind of assignment, which, you know, who writes essays once they're done with school, um, into an assignment that actually shows them the real world value and significance of verifying claims. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of my thing. Well, about John, as I, I worked as a consultant for 15 years. I've written my my fair share of reports that are, you know, this, uh, I think a lot, there's lots of people out there who do write yeah, essays and reports, sure. you know, just, I'm, and I'm not, I'm, that, that is tongue in cheek, but it's also like, I see, Some do, of, yeah. I see the number of emails that my wife writes every day and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, um, uh, I think, and I hope that I'm not stealing Allison's thunder here, but scalability is one of the things that we're really most interested in and personalization of learning is something that we're most, most, um, um, most interested in. And so just, you know, as a direct answer to your question, Fred, I think that X tool would be the personal tutor. Right. And you can see it in a chat GPT right now, where if you prompt it to say, answer this question like a sixth grade teacher or answer this question like I'm a third grader, you know, you have the ability to take math problems, social problems, history, et cetera, and have it delivered in literally different formats. And then, you know, if you extrapolate out that six months, 18 months, you know, two years down the line, imagine that that, that has a has an avatar, a visual, you know, sort of. Uh, visual interface where that avatar is then adapting to whatever needs. So, you know, then your then your gender, you know, you're, 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 you're able to be gender specific, you're able to be ethnically and, and racial inclusive, et cetera. Um, and what if every kid had one of those, you know, our ability to scale the, the teacher, the, you know, the, 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 the coach is, is essentially infinite. And that is, you know, making sure that everybody has access to that kind of thing is, is going to be a decider. I, um, I'll comment and then I want Alice's thoughts. I, I'm a technologist as well. So Stephen, when you talk, I hear my same thoughts like altruistic, what's this possible? But John, when I listen to you, this washes up against the shore of how do, how do I help students use this in a way that furthers learning? And what I'm hearing from you is it's to be skeptical. Don't take something right. at face value. Your ability to question to research, to have your own opinion, uh, and not just give over, you know, uh, I'm gonna cut and paste what ChatGPT says and and even forget to take off the top that said ChatGPT and submit this as an assignment. Like, I I almost get the feeling that your, your nirvana for AI is to have a student stand up and say, I tried this with AI. These are all the reasons that it was wrong. I think it could, I think it should be A, B, C, and D. And I sat down and I did A, B, C, and D. And I still put, and then, and then I still challenge the AI and things. And I agree with this, but I disagree with that. Um, so there's, there's, there's the tool side of it. Like, again, I'm Stephen, I'm more in your core, like what shiny thing can I create? What thing can I do that altruistically? But John, I, your perspective of what practically should be happening with the student when they're encountering this is really good. And I'll, Allison, over to yourself as well, like curious in your thoughts. Yeah, I agree with Stephen. Like, I think the true potential, at least in the field, well, it's for all education, but in the field of online learning for since I've been here 20 plus years is that the real potential of online learning is that it can personalize learning for every student, but we haven't gotten there yet. Like we've got the online courses. It, it's digital content, you get pointed to the right resources if you don't aren't successful on something, test your knowledge, but it's not really taking it to that next level of really engaging the students and knowing what their interests are, their learning styles, and really curating content around that. And I think over the last year, maybe two years, like since the pandemic, when everybody was exposed to online learning, it's the number one topic, even over AI this year, was how do I engage my students online? Like, it's not even close. And even with AI, I thought, like we did a big survey of all of our mm -hmm. attendees and it's still, how do we engage students? And I think 
as Stephen said, it's the potential to really scale this. Like we've got the basics, we've been doing AI and online learning for a while, but how do we really get it for every student to really, here's the content. I know you like this topic, so I'm gonna rework this um, chapter or whatever you have to read or write and bring it down to your grade level of reading, your reading level, um, create a project or something that you can do to really engage you in something you, in a topic you may not really be interested in. Like we as teachers can engage students and stuff that they're interested in, but you still have a full curriculum of all of these standards and not every kid's going to be interested in every single topic. Like I'm not the history buff, but if there was something in a way to get me excited about history, I mean, I'm all for that. And I think it's going to really free up a lot of the teachers' times are really focus on those students that are struggling or need to be pushed a little bit more. So the teacher's job's not going to go away with this personalized learning, but it's going to give them more time to actually teach and coach and really build those relationships with students while they're working on other things. And they'll get that real-time feedback from the AI. And so I think, like, I think that's the biggest power of all of this is it's going to let teachers do their job and what they're really good at is building the relationships and working with students to help them learn. Could I, could Fred, I, Fred, if I could just, oh, oh John, <laughs> I just, I just want to make like so, like just, just, just quickly, like John, I realize right. I may be coming across as kind of a downer uh, no, with please. some of my responses and, and, and concerns, but you know, I am very excited about the potential. I use it every day. I am using it to build courses. I am using it to, um, write standards-based assessments and help identify essential standards in different subject areas. I'm using it to like create role-playing Dungeons and Dragons lessons, and you know, I'm putting Creative Commons licenses on my ways of using um, these tools with students. So you know, I've written three books on it now: one for students, one for teachers, one for you know edu educators in general to help do some of the heavy lifting around solving problems that we face in education. So I don't, I don't mean to come across as like you know, uh, scaring people off of it because I've totally embraced it in my own work and, and my work with students. But like Allison said, um, the, the biggest value in all of this for me is to finally do all the things that we've always said were important that I never had the time to do, mm. and especially freeing up that time so that I can then um, use that for, for more personal feedback with my students, building those relationships, um, because in that online setting, um, it, it's a challenge. So I do have more time now, even though it takes me a little bit more time, um, I do have more time overall to then reach out to my students more. So just, just had to throw that in there. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I, it's, it's good. I just want to paraphrase back. Like what you described wasn't so much as it's going to change the world of education. It just give you more time. If you can, if, if we, if there are tools that come out that are AI powered, that could save 10% of the time for K-12 educators or higher educators throughout the world or the United States or North America, Europe, whatever, the, the difference that that would make would be huge. I mean, people would see it as a benefit, not as a threat. Um, and, and you know, there's, there's certainly threatening things about it that are worth to be concerned about, but it's saving the time uh, for it. And uh, Stephen, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, so I, I, I think, a if ever you'll you'll allow me this analogy just follow along here it's it's a lot like what happens when somebody comes to you and says hey if you won the lottery today what would you do with all the money right if you were that next person to win the let's just say billion dollar lottery the first answer everybody everybody's mouth is hey i'll take a vacation i'll buy a house i'll do some of these things and you really really quickly find that there's you know that 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 peters out very quickly right you get, you get bored. There's only so many things to buy. You can only golf so much, et cetera. And you've got to start filling your time with other things. And my analogy here is, is that you've got to start doing the hard work of living, right? You have to start figuring out how do I give it back? How do I start building, you know, building people up? How do I create a foundation? How do I create a foundation? And blah, 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 right? The same thing with these tools in AI. I think there's an analogy here is that, holy smokes, what if we actually were able to give a personalized tutor to every student in the world? Right. What if, what if we realize that in the next, let's just say, five years, what are we going to do with all that other time that we have? How are we contributing to you know, advancing knowledge? How are we contributing to if, if I'm an L&D, you know, forwarding the business goals of my business or I'm you know, moving from the L&D department to actually having a seat on the, the strategy of the business? Um, 
so as John was rightly pointing out, it's like we, with, when you have tools that create efficiencies, you're then presented with that uncomfortable feeling of like, oh no, all that busy work that kept me busy no longer exists. And so now I actually have to find a way to, to add value. And if it, correct me if I'm wrong, but be, I, I have three, three children and, and they're now in sort of the, I have primary middle school and, and secondary and, and throughout their entire education, I've always heard from the educators uh, that, that um, the future is, can I work in groups? Can I be, have creative solutions? Can I be a problem solver? These kind of things, right? That's, those are the skills we need in the future. And it seems to me like we're now just having this great leapfrog in moment or potential moment where that is coming to fruition. If you talk to my 14 year old right now, he assumes these tools are, are, are for him to use, right? It's not if maybe whatever, like there is an assumption there. And ultimately, you know, the ability to show up and have those critical thinking skills, have the ability to say, wow, that's an interesting solution, but does it fit? Will it work? Does it create a profit? You know, does it, you know, is this going to create damage? Like how, you know, what are the after effects and the, the externalities of it? Um, that's, that's the stuff. And so I think that that folds right back into the, you know, what does the educator focus on? Um, and, you know, how, how are we going to say, look, ah, is it, are my kids cheating or, or are they, not, you know, not going to be developing their brains. That is where the hard work is going to have to happen. Awesome. You, and I want, I think it's worthwhile pointing out, you work with state school systems. You work with large uh, districts who are trying to come out with policies and ways of using technology efficiently. So it's very interesting, the different perspectives here. John is like, okay, I'm in a class and you are up there like, okay, I'm working with large organizations. Um, what do you hear about like the, you know, the idea that there would be, um, okay, per, the, the, I don't know if we use the word yet, personalized instruction. Uh, I'll, I'll try to channel you, channel you for a moment, John. You have a class of 30 students, they show up first day. They're all at different levels. And you're, you're kind of intuitively like a maestro trying to assess out, okay, what's the wind section and what's the drums and like, who, who, who what am I working with here? Um, and you can do that after practice. But maybe there would be some type of assessment that is going to help you. The students will sort of do like a, a little bit of a qualifying session beforehand. I think this gets back to more your Stephen. Like for a tutor to help out, even a physical tutor, a live tutor, they have to assess where students are in their journey, where their gaps are in their knowledge. And before they can do something, which is probably what they're struggling with, which is why they got the tutor, how to shore up those gaps so that they can then do the thing that they want to do but everybody comes in at different levels and it's the job of the teacher to try to bring everybody up to at least a baseline. That takes time. And maybe there are things that are really, you really want to get to, but you kind of got to get this, shore up all this knowledge first before we can kind of get to the good stuff. Um, Allison, do you hear, or do you see organizations moving towards like the tutoring side of AI and trying to figure out how they could use it in the class? And then I want to get your thoughts on it, John. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a little more unique. We are working with the big districts and statewide departments of ed and ministries of ed, but our focus has been more on the online and hybrid classrooms. And cool. a lot of them are already doing those pre-assessments when a student enrolls, like if it's a full-time course or even in a supplemental course, there's usually some kind of pre-assessment to see where they're at. Um, and some courses they can test out of different um, topics or um, projects, but if they've already know that area and then others, the teacher is aware like, okay, they really need a lot of help in this specific area. And so we're, we've seen it in online learning for a while, but it's still, here's your test. Now the teacher has to go back and adjust the coursework and do all that where I think that this is where the scalability comes and the power of AI where they can kind of direct the student and the course is adjusted based on where they're coming in. Um, so I think it's been a little bit easier for us because we're already working with schools and people that are open to this. Um, there are, I think the pandemic helped a little bit too in some cases at, at one point in time. <laughs> like uh, I think John said it earlier, it's all becoming political. Like everything, especially in this country becomes political at some point, but 
at first it was like, okay, online learning is great and there's so much potential. And then it's like, nope, we have to get the kids back in the classroom. That's the only way they can learn. But I think the true power is going to be in the hybrid schools. That's where we're seeing mm -hmm. the most growth is that um, the technology is great, but it is nice for at least a couple of days of the week to be with a teacher and to be with other students, um, collaborating, solving problems, using that time face to face um, to build those relationships with teachers and other students and really get more of that um, smaller group support where they can go off with their tutors or the online digital content and work through that at their own pace. But when they need that extra help, come back to the hybrid school. So we're seeing much more openness to that, the hybrid model mm -hmm. than the fully online school. Um, and as like we learned during the pandemic, the physical schools offer a lot of things that kids can't go fully online, even if they wanted to, because their parents have to work and nobody can stay home with them or they need lunches and food and other things. So I think the hybrid is that sweet spot. And I think now you can have that AI tutor at home and then the teacher in the physical classroom and they can work together to really, like we keep going back to that personalized learning approach where you're getting the best of both worlds and the human interaction and the online. Interesting. You know, I think we've all thought a lot about the student. We've all thought about plagiarism. We thought about what the impact of the student is. But John, I want to go back to you because you look at it from the point of view of the educator. Like, uh, and so doing things for the student implicitly has to do something for the educator. It, any tool yeah. will be available. So, so I'm going to pose you a question. We're, we're in this, it's one year later. We are all meeting right now as we did before. And in that year's time, um, what would you like to be able to do differently as an educator that you think AI has a good shot at helping you do it? Yeah, I mean, so in a, a year from now for doing this, I could tell you all the mistakes I made and how to avoid them. Um, <laughs> so what I'm thinking of right now, you know, for instance, it I, I use Moodle as our LMS. It would take um, a few hours. So let's say, so I've been working on this lately, uh, working on a lesson on elements of a story for a middle schooler. And if I write a quiz on that lesson uh, in Moodle to make a multiple choice quiz, it's going to take me to do it the way I want to do, where it's giving feedback based on every response and like reinforcing the learning, all that. It's going to take me a few hours probably to generate the questions off of the lesson then to put each one in individually. Um, and so I can go into ChatGPT and I use the plus version and have it generate a 30 question uh, multiple choice quiz that does all the things in XML format. I can copy and paste that, save it as an XML document, import it to Moodle, less than 15 minutes, you know, maybe maybe 10. I'm getting pretty good at it now. So um, the way to so the time that that saved now allows me and I'm thinking of getting an, like an interest survey of my of my learners at the beginning of the year to what kinds of things, what kinds of media are they interested in? And so now if they're doing a lesson on elements of a story, I can have ChatGPT write a 30 question quiz um, assessing their knowledge on the elements of a story using Pokemon one using Harry Potter, one using Star Wars, one using you know some anime that they might be interested in. And now I can upload it into my class all in less time than it took me to write one quiz to begin with, which I probably only would have written five questions for a quick formative assessment or practice. Um, but now I can have a 30 question quiz, pull in five random questions, and now they can take that a few different times um, as practice. So I, I'm, I, I can build in practice and, and these quick formative checks in ways I never would have dreamt of before. And, and it's, it's, it wouldn't be much trouble to just continue to do that and build that catalog and library of quizzes so that it becomes less and less time even uh, you know, from year to year. If I, if I may, Fred, I yeah. think I wanna build on that, what John's saying as well, like I, and two threads here, <clears throat> building on what you're saying, John, imagine all of the teachers in the world who you, know, you, every, you, you struggle getting parent interaction right and there's two reasons you know some of the reasons why parents have is because they don't have time but a lot of times it's because they don't understand the material that the kids are bringing home with them right like they either forgot or or they're just not familiar with it or it's new <clears throat> suddenly now you have this ability to say hey look take this home or hey parents you know work with your kids and you you again you have that tutor there 
you know, where you can type in a question and, and have it come back and then sit and have a conversation with your student or, or, or your, your, your child and those kinds of things. But the, the one that was really uh, I, I wanted to put on the table was outside the classroom. If I think of the administration of running a school, of running a, a school district, of running an L&D department, those kinds of things, scheduling classes. Uh, you know, even just creating that, you know, who's teaching what and what students are going in, in which class, right? What is still now for many schools, like, you know, moving tabs around a board to get teachers in the right places, right? AI can do that in seconds, right? If, I, if I'm a teacher and like, hey, look, I need to I need to schedule days off, you should be able to go into your administrative system and say, hey, um, I need to take October 15th through the 30th off because of X, Y, Z. It goes in, books your days off, you know, deducts from your time, tells you how much time you have left, et cetera. That should all be done in a second. <clears throat> and we already have examples of that happening. If I want to communicate with an administrator about, uh, you know, changes or those kinds of things, those that, that communication can happen uh, much more efficiently as well. So thinking about how can this help education and the infrastructure of education and how we deliver it goes way, way, way beyond the classroom, right? It's And, and we have to think about all of the parts around the business of education as well. And I mean that in the broadest sense of the term, uh, just how do we create the infrastructure around it, both in traditional education spaces, but also then in that ongoing lifelong uh, learning that every adult is is required to do now. Uh, I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up because there are so many other aspects of a of a school day and a school where this could benefit us. And I'm even thinking in terms of security with all the anxiety around violence and shooting uh, in the U.S. You know, the, we could do facial recognition and there's all kinds of AI detection um, software available that could be integrated into into these buildings. Um, maybe to provide some more sense of security for for learners. Uh, so, you know, teacher evaluations, um, you know, supporting special ed teachers writing 504 and IEP goals uh, for students um, you know, with unique needs. So, yeah, it, it definitely extends and impacts us well beyond just, just the classroom experience. Interesting. Like what I'm hearing is not so much something new and unimaginative that people haven't thought about before, but really looking at what you do today and increasing the efficiency so that you free up time to take on maybe a more expansive role with the students. Well, that's that's the big way to diffuse an innovation, right, is to is to make it relatable to things that we're already doing. If we present it as a way that is substantially different from what people's current practices are, it won't take off, right? People won't start using it. So we need it to be relatable, observable, trialable, uh, you know, measurable, all those factors of the diffusion of an innovation. So, we, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things I'm trying to focus on right now as I work with um, other schools and teachers is it's not substantially different. It's just, it's going to help support the work that we know we should be doing. Very good. Like I, I mean, I'll use a, an analogy. If I was a tennis instructor and I wanted to help somebody learn how to play better tennis, if I could record them at a high speed video camera and play it back in slow motion for them, they could see step by step what their stroke was and I could guide them into doing better strokes. I might've achieved that on my own, but the technology really short circuited that it's there. That is your stroke. Um, and maybe this goes back to helping the students see their output of their material, but giving you more visibility and more ability and more time to give them feedback and to help them do better. Um, the question I asked earlier, Allison, like if we were here again a year from now and we were um, having the same conversation, uh, I think saving of time does make a lot of sense. But at a policy level or at a broad sense, what would you believe is the probably the likely or the best use of AI at, you know, at the, at the educational level? And it might be what we've already been talking about or it might be something different, but interested in your thoughts. I kind of <laughs> hope that we would that I wasn't going to answer that question. I, no, I'm like trying to think of something different that nobody well, here. Let me, but just let me, I hope it's just part of our daily lives and that this yes. isn't such a huge, like, new topic and new thing. Like, it's just integrated into everybody's daily life and we're okay with it. But now we're trying to figure out how to 
new uses for it, but how to, I don't want to regulate every little piece of it, but like, how do we keep it from all the big scary things that you hear on the news that it's going to derail elections and healthcare and blow up the world and all that bad stuff. But it's more like it is a positive thing. It's not so crazy and scary anymore. It's just a part of life. Like Google is a part of life now or the calculator or cars or other innovative technology. So um, that would be my hope and goal is I, I don't think that's going to happen in a year, but maybe in five years time. But that would be my goal is it, it's a part of our lives. And how do we make life even better than it is now? Because it has so much potential. Very good. And look, I um, I think there's almost two themes. There's what what could it do to save time and increase efficiencies? And what thing could it do that we can't do already? Like, John, you could just work harder and do more. But, but AI, like what you described was, sure, I could create five different personalized quizzes based on the preference of my class, but I'm not gonna spend 20 hours doing it. Um, right, but, but Fred, like, as though, I, and I apologize for jumping in there, but no. I wanna talk about that in the chat, Ow Ow just put out there, it says, let's yes. not, let's not, let's not discard. I'm, I'm a huge fan of leapfrog, right? I call them leapfrog technologies, right? Where it's like, let's actually hop over. <clears throat> like, here's an example again, plug in my summit here, but you know, from some that's going to come out from a, a company called Hour One, they have a great example from the company called Berlitz. And I'm, I hope most people are familiar with Berlitz, but they're a foreign language training service that has been around forever. You know, one of the old, old stalwarts from, from, from many decades now. And one of the things that they've realized is that they can create avatars, right? For, for teachers to deliver online and they can create a lesson and then translate it into 120 languages instantly. Right. And so those same principles of language learning are now available to all of the 120 languages that they teach literally instantly. So when they tweak a course, it's translated instantly to 120 languages. Right. So that's a, that's a leapfrog moment. If you have a say, if you are, let's take it to a non-traditional education, but business application as well. Let's just say that you have, you are manufacturing a product or a, ser or a service and that service evolves or change, right? Every time you change that, you've got to push out new information to your sales force, to your customer service force, et cetera. Usually they're a global sales force or customer service force, and you've got to translate it to the local context. Localization and contextualization, again, is an instantaneous process now. It, I, you have to let that explode in your mind right now. What used to take months and months of hard work by many, many people is now an instantaneous, you know, um, application. And that that's mm. just, it, that's, it's just absolutely ridiculous to think about that. I think, you know, if, for those of you that follow DeepMind and AlphaFold, right, figuring out the proteins uh, and the chemicals around them, that was something we were taking years to do. And uh, DeepMind came up and did something that uh, can do like a hundred million proteins now um, with, that was just a complete game changer. Mm -hmm. We, um, I'm gonna, I, I really uh, welcome the diverse opinions here and just how different perspectives of it. The, uh, I will, I'll put on my techie hat for a moment. I'm kind of with Steven in terms of like a personal tutor. This is my, this is my hope. My hope is that um, we just like, I remember when Minecraft came out and someone pitched it to me, uh, someone at work was playing it and I was like, oh, okay, that sounds cool idea. I don't think that makes any sense. And then I went back home for Christmas and I asked my nephews, do you play Minecraft? And he goes, oh yeah. And I asked them, well, who else at school plays Minecraft? And they just looked me in the face and said, everybody. <laughs> I mean, what, what? You, aren't you playing it? So uh, I believe that if, you, if we get to a place where there's a personalized tutor, and again, there's the Matthew effect going on here, right? We are, there's a very large percentage of the world that do not have access to the internet. Uh, and it's just this, you know, COVID pushed a bit that forward, but man, we got to do a lot more. But for those that have access, you know, I, my belief is that if you, for maybe specialized applications or certain languages, Duolingo is a great example. I'm on day 66 of French. Maybe next year I can say a little bit more in French, <laughs> but if you have a personalized tutor and it is really good at figuring out the gaps in your knowledge and you, you're going to go into John's class and John has said, look, um, just if you're going to really enjoy the class if you if you're at this level no worry if not but if you're not at this level here's some ways to get there and they will they they will help you like the 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 promise the student is like look you could study on your own hard you could try to pick it up in real time traditional 
or you could do a combination where here's something that's going to really coach you and that real time picking up in the class is just going to happen faster so you do less work and you learn faster this is this is me expressing my my hope is we get to a place where there is like a personalized tutor and that uh, it is driven by ai adapted to the student's personal learning but but managed by the school in a way that like john you have classes come in and you see some type of dashboard that tells you all the students have done some assessment figured out the gaps in their knowledge uh, and that there's some things working behind the scenes to help solve those gaps it's just as it's working foreground for you to help free up time and the amount of time that you get to engage with students because of the ai being a supportive role is more and and that personalized part plus freeing up your time it feels like these are the two things that are, are kind of obvious but it has to get to a place going maybe what Allison you were saying it has to get to a place where it's comfortable like there has to be an adaptation of knowledge and it's going to be a little scary because people are going to say oh this is going to change the world probably not um, but we all adapted to social media now it's just vernacular we expect to be able to change things online and twitter or facebook or instagram i i expect to email somebody i'm, I'm constantly on the phone with somebody in europe and like okay i'll send you the document two seconds passed have you got it yet like we just expect it to be that that instantaneous and there's this progression i think we have to go through with ai um so let me let me turn it back and we'll do a few closing remarks so uh i'll start uh stephen i'll start with you then i'll do john then i'll allison I'll, I'll finish up with you uh stephen if you're to fill in the sentence my hope is that uh, AI and education will achieve the following benefit. We don't have to describe how it would be done, but maybe it could be something that probably is very hard to do today or maybe impossible. But if you could take one benefit that uh, AI could achieve or help achieve in the educational industry, what would that benefit be? And I'm going to be gonna... really uh, philosophical in my answer here sure. simply because I think what my big hope is, and it comes back to my very first premise, is that I think creating these efficiencies and moving all this busy work out of the way allows us to really focus on the human experience. And my hope is, is that we'll have educators that are focusing on building social relations or helping students to build social relations, that they'll have leaders in businesses and L&D departments, you know, work, you know, figure out how people can work in teams and across borders and, you know, uh, through conflict better and easier and work on those skills and build those muscles of being humans together. Simply because, as you just pointed out, we are totally connected <clears throat> and we expect answers instantaneously, but the human experience is necessarily messy. And so working on those problems is what my hope is that we will be able to concentrate and focus on and get through in the future. Thanks, Stephen. So, John, your thoughts? Yeah. So I would just add that um, you know a lot of times we expect um, all teachers to be experts on everything, and we provide all this professional development on these topics. And um, you know, I I am fortunate to have twenty four years of experience as these tools are you know starting to come out and interact with them in a way where I can look for things like implicit bias. And I've been doing equity work for my entire career, building curriculum my entire career. So, you know, I'm able to build these things in. Um, but a lot of early teachers don't have the benefit of all that professional development and experience. So this will be a shortcut for them. So while they may not have all the vocabulary to talk about those topics, you know, with a very basic understanding and a little bit of prompt engineering, they can develop materials and communications that incorporate those things that we all think are important. Um, but they may not have had the the skills and resources to do that yet. And then we can vet those responses and then start integrating them, um, you know, just so much faster than we were ever able to before. Nice. And then Allison, if there was one thing that AI could do in the coming year to achieve some benefit, what, what would you like to see that benefit be? I think like I had in my doctorate program, I, one professor when we first started was like, life is all about relationships. Like this is a technology program or um, program that you're gonna get your doctorate in and you're gonna get caught up in the technology. And I think this technology is going to allow 
teachers and students to go back to really building those relationships. I think that's the power of online learning. Um, most online teachers say that they know their students better than they did their face-to-face -face students. And I think that's really gonna allow, AI will help spark that learning, really focus on other things and let the students learn at their own pace, but the teachers and the students are gonna be able to come back to building those true relationships that are really gonna ignite and spark that true love for learning that we all as teachers and educators that's all our goal all the time. So I think it goes back to relationships and it's going to allow for that again. Very good. I'll, I'll add my thoughts to it. I'll give it by analogy. I, I'll use another tennis analogy. Um, a couple of years ago, I was at a conference. There was a tennis uh, club. I went to a tennis club. I paid for some instruction as part of a group lesson with three other people. I don't remember the lesson, but the part that's vivid is the four of us playing and the instructor was calling out from the sidelines okay do this do that and we were just hitting it and it just seemed like man i'm playing tennis better than i played in a long time and it was that uh relationship that uh that the instructor was building between us and coaching us and encouraging us and in the context of the world's problems i don't think the world's problems can be solved by individuals anymore i think it has to be solved by groups of people who are really good at working together and have uh built into or bought into the idea that I am going to be able to work and solve problems when I work more effectively with each other. And if the AI frees up the ability for the instructor to foster those interpersonal, those teamwork skills, it doesn't mean all disciplines. Um, I think we'll just graduate students who are going to be more effective at tackling the world's problems and uh, ready to use like AI as a tool to do that. But they're going to be able to do it with others and work really effectively together as a group. All right, I, um, I will make the offer that we will be here next year. At uh, the same time, we'll pick up the discussion <laughs> where we left off. We'll see how we did. Uh, I really thank uh, Allison, John, and Stephen for sharing their time with us and their expertise. And I thank you all for joining. And I uh, will stop the recording now. Uh, we might linger for a few moments. But again, thank you all for joining. That was a great session. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank fun. you.